Well, welcome back. It's time for the second part of the France Van Cap debate. Now, there's less than 100 days to go until America votes for president. Well, the man challenging, well, expected to challenge uh, President Barack Obama, we still have to wait for that convention in August, of course, uh, is Mitt Romney. And today he's ending up a tour of... U.S. allies to Poland. He's also been to the U.K. and to Israel. Well, the tour's been called gaff-prone in much of the Western media, but will it harm Romney's chances at home? Well, let's take a look at this. This is the latest national opinion poll uh, by Gallup, and there you can see neck and neck. This is national, 46% for Barack Obama, 46% will vote for Mitt Romney, if they're to be believed what they're saying today. Well, a reminder of who our guests are tonight. Christopher Dickey is the Paris Bureau Chief for Newsweek. Eric Svein is a member of Republicans Abroad. Democrats Abroad, I should point out, didn't want to take part tonight. Uh, in Maine, in the United States, Aaron David Miller is a scholar at the Wilson Center. And in Israel, Mordechai Kadar is at uh, Bar Ilan University. Thanks indeed to you all for being with us tonight. Now, Eric, uh, we've talked about the rather controversial stuff that went on in Israel, but uh, you would think that a trip to the UK would be a no-brainer. I mean, the special relationship and all the rest of it, but Romney managed to, to really rub the Brits up the wrong way, didn't he? Well, first of all, you have to, you have to know that he was, he was of course, he, one of the reasons he became famous is that he was in charge of the Olympics in Salt Lake City, uh, what is it, 20 years ago? I forget. A long time. And that, he, that the big news of that, of that uh, year was that he, he was the first person to make it successful financially mm -hmm. and not to put the city in, into, into the red. And, but he, he, what he, he said that the Olympics was disconcerting. But it, what, all he's been doing really has been repeating what the British media has been uh, saying for the past month. They've been complaining. They said it on there the been, day of the opening ceremony. Well, there have been complaints. Well, there have been one complaint after the other, and uh, the, la the final complaint was that the, the, the stadiums are empty, or some stadiums are empty. And I think... I don't know. I think he, sh he should have a. I think he should have his say. All right, Aaron David Miller, what's your take on that? My, again, my take is that uh, the guy isn't thinking before he's talking, <laughs> and, and I think it's not. It, 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 it may be a testament to the fact that he hasn't had a lot of experience handling a variety of issues, um, which uh, um, you know are, are, are complex. But, but here again, you've got uh, a guy who presumably understands the limitations, the challenges of what it is required to put together an international event, which is as complex as the Olympics. You, you, would, have, you would have thought, given the fact that he's there in, in the capital of America's, clo literally America's closest ally, at a time when Britain is feeling incredibly positive, about its own self-image, um, regardless of how this Olympics actually turns out, that he would have been a tad more uh, sensitive and, uh, and politic on this issue. So, again, not fatal, and frankly, in the end, I would argue not even relevant. Back to the main event here. The reality is, with 8.2% unemployment, a majority of Americans convinced that the country is moving in the wrong direction. Uh, this election is not going to turn even on the competent, perceived competency of either candidate with respect, to, uh, with respect to foreign policy. So this was a very political trip designed to be orchestrated and stage managed in a way that was to be um, flawless. It didn't quite come out that way, but in the end, uh, it's not going to matter. Turn or fall on whether or not Americans are prepared to answer two questions. Number one, is the guy in the White House responsible for my misery? If the answer to that is yes, then they'll ask themselves the second question. Is his opponent capable of addressing my, my misery? And if enough people answer yes to both questions, we'll have a new president. Well, it is looking like a tight race if you believe the opinion polls. Um, Christopher Dickey, he managed to not only upset the British, he upset the British Conservatives. I mean, the Republicans and the Conservatives are supposed to be natural bedfellows, aren't they? Yes, I love David Cameron's remark that um, uh, the Salt Lake City Olympics were nowhere. Where's that? <laughs> nowhere. And then there was a headline in one of the papers that described uh, Mitt Romney as the nowhere man. Um, but, you know, I do think that that whole flap was kind of unfair to Romney, to tell you the truth. Disconcerting, that's certainly not the most pejorative word that was ever used. Uh, and I think that Aaron, who's always the voice of reason, 
was right. People jumped on this for various reasons because the Brits are feeling so proud of themselves right now, and anything even slightly negative <laughs> was something they could go after. And the tabloids had fun with headlines like Myth the Twit, but it isn't going to make a big difference. Um, it's interesting if you compare Romney's tour to uh, Obama's pre-election tour back in 2008. I mean, everybody remembers the crowds uh, in Berlin, you know, huge adoring crowds. I mean, Romney would only dream of that, wouldn't he? Well, um, the left gets a better gets a better uh, view, uh, get a, gets better coverage by the mainstream media, and uh, a lot. But it wasn't they, the media; it was the people. It was the, the pe well, the people, people the who streets. read the media and who never hear about the who hear who read about every mistake, every mistake that George W. Bush said, but they, who never hear that when Obama um, you know, I think mentions the, the fifty-seven war states. Has something the, to do with mentions it. the fifty-seven That's not states. Just a gap. Yeah, he doesn't mention the fifty-seven states that Obama mentions, or when he gave, gave a gift of twenty DVDs to uh, Prime Minister Gordon Brown, or an iPad to the Queen filled with his speeches. I mean, come on, if that had been George W. Bush or or Romney or McCain or Sarah Palin, they, uh, the, all the American, all, every American would know about it. You know, because it's a leftist and, and Obama, the mainstream media ignores it or puts it on page 20 in the, right, in the bottom right, paragraph. Right. I, I, wonder, I wonder if it's the opposite situation uh, in Israel. Perhaps you can help us with that, Mordechai Kadar. Do the, do the Republicans get an easier ride in the Israeli press or is it the Democrats? Well, it depends which press, because Israel is divided very sharply between leftist uh, 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 media and right-wingish. So uh, definitely the uh, right-wingish uh, media wasn't much in favor of uh, Mitt Romney. But uh, just to combine the two uh, items, apparently the road to Washington, D.C., goes through Jerusalem and not as much as through London. What do you make of that, Chris? Well, I think uh, that Mordecai is probably right. The, uh, certainly not through London. That's not going to change many votes, whereas if in Jerusalem uh, Romney was going after money and a very concentrated, very committed electorate in the United States that identifies very closely with Israel and which... Uh, which Obama has not done a very good job of courting uh, over the last four years. So I think it was a smart move for Romney to go to Jerusalem, and in, in that sense, I think Mordecai is probably right. One of the fascinating things about American and Israeli politics is how deeply interwoven they are, where you had, it, it was a little bit clearer when you had a labor Likud split, but in those days, you could see the Labor Party deeply identified with the Democratic Party and its candidates, and vice versa. Bill Clinton campaigned for Shimon Peres in the 1990s. And you can see the Likud party identified very closely with the Republicans, especially with the neoconservative part of the Republican Party. Mm. Uh, and to some extent, that's still playing out. You, still, you certainly see that Likud uh, Republican identification. On the Democratic side, it's a little fuzzier now with Kadima and the, and the breakup of the Labour Party. And, and what about in Europe? What about the identification here in Europe? I mean, do you think the, the Republicans and the Conservatives still have things in common, for example, yeah, I do, but I think that, you know, in generally speaking, the, the political spectrum, at least in continental Europe, is so far to the left mm. that the, often the Republicans have a little problem figuring out what to make of it. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, I think certainly in Britain, you would think that the Tories and the Republicans uh, would have uh, a natural rapport. But at the end of the day, it often comes down to personalities and, specific, and always to specific interests and issues. And Cameron and uh, Obama have gotten along very well. Um, Aaron David Miller, if I could bring you back in. Uh, there's been uh, some comment that Obama is gentle in word but aggressive in deed. I mean, if you look back at his foreign policy uh, achievements uh, over the past few years, I mean, of course, he, he has made long speeches in the Middle East, but he managed to deliver uh, Osama bin Laden. Uh, he's ended the wars in Iraq and in Afghanistan again. Uh, this well, seems to be at odds with the criticism he gets of being friendlier to America's enemies than he is to America's foes? Well, first of all, that, 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 that criticism exists on the margins. I mean, the whole notion, and let's be clear here, this has been a, a relatively competent foreign policy at a time when the American public uh, is focused on not reengaging in discretionary wars, but extricating themselves from them. 
and from the terrible losses, 6,000 Americans dead in Iraq and Afghanistan, over a trillion expended and counting, and an incredible loss of American credibility. This president, and again, I have been extremely critical um, uh, of him in, in, in many respects, but with respect to foreign policy, Barack Obama is a man of his times. There has been no spectacular failures in his policy and no spectacular successes. And the fact is, that's exactly what American priorities call for at the moment. The notion, and one of your guests expounded it, I mean, I worked for a half a dozen secretaries of state, um, from George Shultz through Colin Powell, Republicans, Democrats. The notion that somehow the American people care and or that, in fact, there is truth to the fact that Barack Obama doesn't believe in American exceptionalism, that he's an apologizer in chief. I mean, these are comments made by uh, Republicans who frankly are trying to figure out a way to differentiate themselves uh, from the current president when, in fact, on most issues uh, regarding matters of peace and war, there is a high degree of coincidence that exists in actual policy terms between uh, Romney and Barack Obama. And, and look, again, it's silly season. Campaigning is one thing, governing is, um, is quite another. One, one final comment. The notion that the road to the White House lies through Jerusalem is is I, I'm not even so sure how to respond. I mean, <laughs> yes, yes, it is important in an election year to ensure that if you're a Democratic president, that that part of your Democratic base, the five and a half million American Jews, most of whom identify with Democrats, they're not single issue voters, and are going to vote for Barack Obama regardless of what his policies on Israel are. But the notion somehow that that all of, that this is needless, gratuitous pandering. This is how American elections are done. The Israelis are a part of the domestic landscape, but the notion that this election is going to be determined by what American Jews think or don't think about Mitt Romney or Barack Obama, I think is validation, frankly, of a okay. uh, of one of those darker tropes Let's that... One of those darker yeah. tropes that um, I'd, I'd rather not um, I'd, I'd rather not see in such a conversation. Yeah, yeah, uh, and I think that the, Aaron's exactly right uh, that the that it won't be decided. But the actual question was whether it went through London or went through Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is more important to the American po body politic than London is. Right. Okay. All right. He's a really smart guy, but he would also answer that question. The road to the White House probably lies runs through neither. <laughs> All right. Um, anyway, a lot of points there for you to respond to, but namely uh, the criticism, as I mentioned, uh, often leveled at Obama is that he's made uh, America's enemies feel safer and its friends feel less safe. As we've just heard, uh, Aaron well, David Miller doesn't agree. I think Romney also went to Warsaw, and in Warsaw uh, he, he met with uh, um, Lech Walesa, who, who Obama did not want to meet with. You know, he meets with Putin, he meets with Medvedev, he, he talks to them friendly, you know, he, he's, his, his, friendly, his friendly talks with them are captured on microphone. And then when uh, he, he has to give a, uh, uh, a medal to a Polish-American hero from, I think it was American, I'm not sure, maybe it's just Polish, from World War II, he's, uh, he says, we do not want, well, he or his, the, the Obama White House says, we do not want the Lech Walesa to come here. Uh, and they're both uh, P uh, Nobel Peace Prize winners, you know, except I think Walesa did a lot more than Obama did when he won his. And uh, Walesa has come out for Mitt Romney. Of course he has, because uh, Walesa, uh, Obama loves to talk to, to, to who, to Medvedev, to, to Putin, and then, and then he, uh, he drops the, the, the Eastern and the Euro Europeans, but all, and all because mm -hmm. he believes in this... Again, in this fairy tale where, oh, if we're all friendly to each other, everything will be cool and Americans will be loved by the foreigners. Yeah, he was and really friendly to Osama bin Laden. Yeah. We, and they've just found out, they've just found out that he refused, that no, three that's times been he said, no, 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 no. It was only no. on the fourth time that they suggested no, he killed no. him that he agreed. You mean three when they thought he could do it no. and when they did do it. 
let's talk about the Polish ship because that was about uh, Romney um, standing up to Russia, wasn't it? That was uh, partly to show solidarity with the Poles. There's a large Polish-American vote in the U.S., but well, it's also yeah, about standing up to Russia. Well, yeah, I think it was about a large Polish-American vote in the United States is mm. what it was about. Well, it's all, sure excuse me, could, but it's, sure, isn't it sure also... Can, one, hey, wait, I think you had it. Please, please. You interrupted me, but that's okay. Go ahead. You'll get your save. Please. No, go ahead. We're running out of time, gentlemen, so right. one at a time, please. It was about the Polish-American vote. It's, the, whole, the whole trip was about domestic votes in the United States on the margins in an election that's going to be very close. So, and he doesn't need to make a show of standing up to the Russians or the former Soviet Union uh, with his conservative voters because they all believe this line that's being parroted right here that somehow Obama's been, par- been apologizing to the world for being an American. But he does need to consolidate support among Catholics and especially among Poles, and that's what he was doing. Well, it's not only that. It's also Russia's attitude. And it's not only American conservatives who believe that these, you know, these people who are clueless. It's also the Poles, the Czechs, the Hungarians, etc. Now, in the past, now one of the uh, previous idiots among the Republicans before W. Bush and before Mitt Romney and before Sarah Palin was Ronald Reagan. Strangely enough, there's been a, a, a second statue put in up of, of Poland of an American president. It's Ronald Reagan. There's a statue of Ronald, of Ronald Reagan in Hungary, in Budapest. There's one in Prague. And it's very strange that they don't put up the statues to Jimmy Carter or to Barack Obama. Maybe they think that the people who are talk with strength to the Russians, to the Russian bear, know, know better what the reality is and don't believe in the, in the leftist fairy tales. All right, Aaron, David Miller, just briefly before we go, uh, do you think this trip uh, has helped or hindered Romney? Yeah, and I think it's, uh, I, I, I think basically it, 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 it's a wash. Among, uh, among key constituencies, he may pick up a few votes, but in the end it's not going to be determinative. I might, I might point out uh, also, the, your, your guest is talking about who's putting up monuments to whom. There's, no, there's also no monument to George H.W. Bush. I, I might add... Probably the last time we had an effective. No, there's one to Ronald Reagan. Or Pers- that's precisely that's, the point. Right. That's right. So don't. It's, that's so precisely the point. You mentioned Jimmy Carter and Barack Obama, Democrats, who I'm uh, I'm assuming you think are, are weak apologists. But just keep in mind that Ronald Reagan's successor probably managed the most effective foreign policy that the United States has had in the last 20 plus years. Except when, he took, except when he failed to take down Saddam Hussein, which would have avoided a whole lot of problems in the, next, in, the, in the following years. Right. During the Gulf War in 1991. Gentlemen, gentlemen I'm, sure, I'm sure we could go on all night, but we've run out of time. Aaron David Miller. Aaron David Miller, thank you very much indeed. I'm terribly sorry to cut you off. Very interesting to hear your point of view there. Aaron David Miller, uh, Eric Svein. Christopher Dickey and Mordechai Qatar, thank you very much indeed to you all. Thanks to you for watching. That's it for tonight's debate. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow. 